All right, hello Seattle, how we doing? All right, good, just make sure you're awake. <laughs> okay, so a little bit about me, uh, I'm Evan, I help maintain both the OTEL collector and OTTL, both of which I've been contributing to for roughly about two years now. And uh, before we get started, I wanna quickly go over what we're gonna cover today. So I'm gonna give a quick intro to the OTEL collector, I know we've talked about it a little bit, but. Uh, we're going to go a little bit deeper, so I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page, and then I'm going to cover what OTTL is. After that, I'm going to introduce a hypothetical situation that I've uh, devised that we're going to solve using OTTL and a handful of popular components. Uh, and I'm hoping that by the end of this, you're going to have an idea of how you could apply these components to your own setups. So first, uh, for anyone who isn't familiar, the collector sits as a middleware in your observability pipelines and can process and route data as it flows through. Um, the collector's flexibility comes from its internal pipeline model, which is composed of different components that you can string together. And data comes into the collector through receivers, you'll see that on the left there, which translate an external format into the collector's internal uh, pipeline data format and the data stays in this internal format until it leaves the collector. Uh, after receivers, the data will go through processors which can redact, filter, enrich, et cetera, and then finally it leaves the collector at exporters which translate that into an external format and send it somewhere else, for example, to an OTLP endpoint. Uh, something really cool though is that you can connect pipelines together with components that are called connectors. And you can do all sorts of things with connectors, but the thing that I'm gonna focus on today is just gonna be routing data. So a quick intro to OTTL. OTTL is an easy to read language that allows reading from and writing to data in place as it flows through the collector. It's steadily becoming the standard way to work with data in the collector since it's flexible and offers a common configuration format across a whole bunch of different components that use it. Um, and since all collector components work with this internal data format, you can use OTTL without having to worry about the input or output format of the data. And at the bottom here, you can see an example OTTL statement. So this just basically sets an attribute where some name matches a regular expression. So hopefully pretty straightforward, easy to read. Moving into the case study, uh, let's consider a company, uh, Global Telescopes, that is a telescope manufacturing and sales conglomerate that sells to organizations worldwide. And to serve its customers where they are, it has applications that are hosted in regions around the world. Uh, but this comes with some complexity, and to deal with local data privacy laws and scale their telemetry processing, the applications send their data to sidecar collectors that filter out extra data and redact it uh, before it leaves the region. After it leaves the region, uh, the data is then collected into a centralized collector where they can take actions that need to be handled company-wide or otherwise require a single collector instance. And for this example, let's say that the gateway collector needs to do two things. Uh, first, as conglomerates do, the Global Telescopes company just acquired another company that is being added to its consumer retail arm, and the new teams haven't yet fully integrated with the rest of the company, so the data from their apps needs to be routed into their old backend. And then for the rest of the data that is routed into the company-wide backend, it needs to be sampled to cut down on costs, and they want to do tail sampling to uh, do this. That needs to be added into a single collector to work properly. Um, so if you look at this setup here, this is a uh, basically a pipeline diagram model for a single region uh, for what this would look like uh, inside of the collectors that we've configured. So basically data comes in through OTLP, is processed in the sidecar in the filter and transform processors, and then is sent on to the second collector which determines where the data needs to go using the routing connector, and then finally samples with the tail sampling processor for the data that ends up in the company-wide backend. Diving into it, let's start with the sidecar. So first, we want to use the filter processor to filter out a bunch of data. Uh, sometimes the developers leave their log level at a little higher setting than they should, and these logs are pretty noisy, so we wanna filter them out. Or uh, as Jamie was talking about earlier, maybe they have some extra span events uh, from their instrumentation that we wanna get rid of. Um, regardless, um, the filter processor can do the job. So for this example specifically, uh, collector log levels are stored as integers and lower numbers mean noisier logs. So we wanna cut out anything that's at debug level or lower. Uh, however, we still wanna keep info and error level logs. So those are going to be passed through. Uh, and with that, we've cut out quite a bit of data. So we can now move on to 
um, additional processing on the logs, so we want to parse them now. The logs are sent to the collector in JSON, but we want them in a structured format, so we need to parse them here. And before we dive too deep into this, I do want to call out OTTL's cache feature, which basically serves as a way to store temporary data inside of a map while you're working with something. So the cache starts out empty before the first statement there, and then after the very last statement is going to be cleared once again before the next payload comes in. So purely temporary and only is used to hold data while we're doing these computations. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna parse the body, put it in the cache, and then we're going to take the parsed attributes map and parse log body out and then put them on the structured log. And at the result of this, we get a structured log. With that, we can now redact some stuff out of it. So let's say we have a purchase ID and this is considered PII. So we want to redact this before sending it to our backend. And to make things interesting, let's say that we also need to handle data deletion requests. So in order to do that, we would need to be able to locate the data inside of our backend, given some customer input. Let's say they give us the purchase ID and we want to be able to find the equivalent data for that. Uh, we could hash it, let's say, using a SHA-256 hash. So first, uh, I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this as advice for how to handle PII. It's just illustrative. Um, but what we could do here is we could uh, basically take the purchase ID out of an attribute, uh, match it with a regular expression, and then use the match group to, uh, as input to a SHA-256 function and then replace the attribute on there. Um, and a cool thing about this is that that SHA-256 function is actually like an OTTL function. It's not hard-coded into the replace pattern function at all. You could replace it with whatever hashing uh, algorithm that you wanted. And additionally, that whole function argument is optional. So if you didn't pass that in, it would just use the capture group without uh, hashing it at all. And, um, but if you, you know, obviously you've wanted it, you can have it there too. Um, so with all the data reacted, the data can now safely leave the region and we can move on to the second collector here, which has the pipelines that are covered, uh, they're highlighted in this diagram. Um, so we're gonna route and then we're gonna sample. Uh, let's start with routing and then after we route, if it goes to the retail pipeline, no more processing is needed, that team will handle it. So we can quickly cover that. Uh, we can do that with the routing connector. So the routing connector also supports OTTL. And we have this pretty easy. All of our applications are already annotated with what branch of the company they apply to. So we can just check if it's anything that starts with retail, goes to the retail backend, we're done. Anything else goes to the company-wide backend. And with that, we're done with the retail pipeline. So we can move on to uh, our company-wide pipeline that is mostly for industrial telescopes. Um, and Again, we need to do sampling there. So we're going to use this tail sampling policy, and this checks does a handful of uh, checks using OTTL before determining whether to sample it or not. Uh, if any of these conditions matches, then the trace is sampled. If none of them match, then it's dropped. So first, we wanna make sure that if there's an error, we know about it, so we're gonna sample all errors. Uh, then we really like to be paid, so anything from the payment service is definitely sampled, uh, and everything else we do a pretty rudimentary uh, sampling algorithm where we get the hexadecimal representation of our random trace ID and then check if it starts with one of the 16 hexadecimal characters, in this case A, um, and that gives us a one in 16 chance of data being sampled. So with this, we've cut down the data that we have. Uh, we're good to go. The data is then forwarded to the company-wide backend. And this is the resulting config. You can see here that it's pretty simple. Everything's configured uh, using like the same kind of configuration format. It's all OTTL. I do want to call out that this is not a production-ready config. There's a couple of like recommended options that I've left out of here just to make the config a bit shorter. But this should hopefully give you an idea that you can use a variety of different components and they're all kind of configured in the same sort of way and that you can more or less kind of tweak and query how you like. Uh, finally, uh, I do want to cover some, some new features here that we've added recently. Uh, first, the one I, or two of these first two I've covered uh, earlier, uh, the first one's optional parameters. So for example, for this parse key value function, uh, we have a default delimiter and users might want to override that. So they're given the option to set their own delimiter if they want. Similarly with functions as parameters, you can pass in a function if uh, your function accepts that, if it matches the function signature. Uh, not common, but useful for complex use cases. And then finally, we've added 15 new functions so far this year. 
and we're continually adding more. So if there's functionality that you feel like was missing prior, uh, check back because it might be there now. Going forward, uh, looking a little bit ahead, we're gonna be looking at how to handle list values. That's something that is kind of a bit of a gap right now and we'd like to improve. Uh, and then we're gonna be looking at trying to stabilize OSTL in the transform processor, uh, looking ahead to hopefully consolidating uh, basically that list of processors, possibly a few more um, into the transform processor, just make it easier for users to determine which processor to do. Um, and here are some doc links if you wanna scan or type those in, but um, I'll leave this up, but we're done. I think we're ready for questions now. Right, um, okay, so that is, I'm definitely not the expert on this, but there are, um, persist, uh, there are extensions that allow you to persist data in the pipelines on disk or on a store like S3 or something like that. So that could be one option. Second, you would also want in your pipeline some retry logic. So say you have a collector crash, you know, it's got some data in its pipeline, but you've persisted that it's safe. You're gonna be still sending data to it. You'll want retries for when the collector comes back up. So, okay, uh, <laughs> that, that's a tough question and I'm definitely not qualified to answer it, but my understanding of how that would work is I would probably recommend sharding. You check the trace ID and then you use that to route to a particular collector. I, I Drossi, does that sound like a good, okay. <laughs> Cool, okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, so for here was the flexibility, but I would recommend to do it as close to the source as possible. So the reason that I had this in the example here, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot to repeat the question. The question is, is there a reason that you would want to hash um, PII in the collector as opposed to as close to the application as possible? Um, and again, I would do definitely do that as close as possible. And the, um, yeah, there's no reason to do it any further, but the reason I did it here was because if you were in the same, re like usually PII, you don't want it to leave the region, right? So if you put a collector as close as your application as possible, you can be sure it won't leave the region unredacted. A good question. Um, I'm happy you asked actually because I didn't get, or I didn't take time to call it out. Um, so the question is, is there any good way to test OTTL? Um, and the answer is yes. Tyler actually just added some debug logging. So if you turn on debug logging in the collector, it'll print out debug logs that show the state of the data before and after an execution. Uh, we're also, and this is being reviewed right now, I think it's actually being pretty, it's pretty close to being merged. Uh, we're adding traces as well to the transform processor. Uh, 